Hello everyone. My name is Ann Mitchell. I work here at Ancestry.com. I'm one of the product managers and I also write the Ask Ancestry and column. Today uh, we were asked to do a presentation on what if there isn't an index. Some of our collections we either are in the process of indexing but we have the images ready so we put them out or they're just not really feasible to index. So how do you go about finding the information in them? So what I thought I would do is just sort of walk through an example. And with this example I'm going to do live uh, because I think it makes it a little bit more meaningful. This one is hard to do the cut and the paste with. I hope you all can see it. I've done it. Um, I tried to make the font really big. I know that we have some problems with live stream when you go full screen. So bear with. We're still working on finding what the best answer is to that. So. The one that I want to look at today is U.S. Compiled Revolutionary War Military Service Records. And of course, I noticed some of you from the U.K., so this particular collection may not be as useful to you, but the idea is the same. And like I said, we have this, we have all these images ready to go. And instead of waiting till they get indexed, because indexing takes a long time, as you know from 1940, then you have to get everything loaded up onto the system. So if we make you wait, you just don't have access to the images. So we'd like to give you that access. So if you run across one of these data collections, and let's hope everyone can see that. What you're going to notice is there's just not a lot going on in that search form. There's no names but you know their names in here. There maybe is a keyword, but this is probably matching a military unit. And you'll notice there's a surname range. Quite truthfully, I don't know how you're gonna search on that. So this is not a data collection that you can go through, do a search, and assume you're gonna find out who you want. So what is the first thing you should do? Well, this is really the first thing that you should do on any data collection, and you should understand what's in the data collection. Underneath the search form on any data collection, you'll see what we call source information. This is really good information. It gives you everything, well hopefully, that you'll want to know and maybe other places to look. It tells you where this came from. These are NARA, our National Archives records. It'll tell you what the publication role is. You can always go to the National Archive and look up the pamphlet on this and it will tell you more. And then it gives you a description about what's in here. This database is, contains compiled military service records for the following individuals who served in the American Revolutionary War on the U.S. site. Um, so regular soldiers, militia who served in the, with the Continental Army. Now, that's really important because I don't believe that it holds all the militia. And a lot of the states had militia, so you may not find your ancestor in here. Naval personnel, members of the Quartermaster General, members of the commissary. And then it tells you what you're going to find. The compiled service records consist of a jacket envelope for each individual labeled with their name, other information, and then within abstracts of entries relating to the soldier. Now why is that important? What that means is there were more than one page for any given record. So even once you find your ancestor, you don't want to stop at just that page. You want to make sure you look through all of the images associated with that first record until you find who it, or you find everything that's associated with it, or you may miss something. It is very important to read what's actually in there. All right, so the next thing you do, once you understand what it is that you want to go look for, over here on the right, and this is true of any data collection that we have, you have a browse this collection. Sometimes it's easier just to browse a collection. So, what it tells you here is that we've got these broken up by state, within state by military unit, and within military unit, a surname range. So, if you look at state, you'll see that we have Connecticut, Continental Troops, a bunch of different states. You'll notice it says M881 and M880. Now, if you'd read the data, the source information under the, the search form, you know what that stands for. Those are the groups at NARA that these come from, so you know how they're organized. 
So let's just pick one here at random. I'll go with North Carolina. So if I click on North Carolina, it will then tell me what are all the military units underneath that. Now this can be a bit hit or miss. If you're lucky enough to know what regiment your ancestors served with, you can go there. If not, you may have to look through all of these. No one said that this wasn't particularly tedious, but you know, this is how people used to have to search through microfilms and when they went and they searched through actual records. Gives you a good reason to appreciate a little good indexing or even bad indexing. So you can say, click on fourth regiment, this particular surname range, it's all in the same group. All right, so what you see here is one of these first cards. And if you've looked at the Civil War cards, you notice that they're very, very similar. So we can move down. This gentleman was a Alexander William, and I'm assuming that is his last name, was a captain and a lieutenant. And I need to move this over so I have access to the arrow here. Maybe not. All right, we'll do it this way. Um, and then if you go through, you will find different records for this gentleman whose name is Alexander. Okay, well, let's say that you have somebody whose name is Smith. Pick that one at random because he probably lives inside this directory. You notice there are 362 images. That is right up here. You will always know the number of images in here. So, you know, Smith is near the end of the alphabet. So let's say that we go, you know, you do the binary search thing. You'll do 300. Great. You see that's a T-I-M. Okay, so Smith is before that. So maybe you shave a few pages off, 275. There's Steed. You know you're going in the right direction, but you're not there. And you go back some more. There's a Samuel Smith, and if you're lucky enough, this could be your person. You'll notice this is not the cover card, and because you took the time to look at it in the beginning, you know there should be one. So you know to go back, and there's his cover card. He was in the 4th North Carolina Regiment. He was a private. And you'll notice on these particular cards, this number here, all that means is those are the number of cards within that particular folder. So you just know you have one to look at. But it's always good to go until you hit the actual next cover card. So that's an example of how you would look through an index. Another really good example of this, and let's go back to the Ancestry.com homepage, is the 1940 census. I saw somebody say they couldn't wait for Ohio to be indexed. Or Indiana. I personally am waiting for Indiana and North Carolina, but I understand your all's pain. But while we're waiting, we can go to the 1940 census page. And if we go down here, it will take us to this cover page. And again, this is the same thing. We have a browse this collection. You were doing the same thing. You can use different methodologies to understand what's in there and it will lead you to the right place. So, simply, if you have an unindexed collection or if you're not finding what you're looking for, what you want to do is read about the collection, understand how it's organized, and then start looking through it. Here's another type of collection that you may find that isn't exactly indexed in the best way. I'm going to go up here to the card catalog. We have a lot of family and local histories. These family and local histories are what we call OCR or op optical character recognition data. They are not always the best index. This particular technology sometimes leaves a lot to be desired. So while I could go in here and search for my ancestor, depending on how well his name was actually OCR, he may be in here and I may not be finding him. So this is also the type of document, and this happens in both newspapers and books. But this is the type of document that you actually want to go through and understand what's in there and start looking through. Now a lot of these books will have indexes. You should go look at the index. But understand how they're actually keyed and then start to go through them. Read what there is about it. This one doesn't have a lot of data, but it does tell you where it came from. And then you can go in and then you can start to read 
what is going on in this particular image. This one is not that exciting on the first few pages, but, and then you can also try and go to the very end and see if there is actually an index. Usually we have those actually mapped, but that will give you an under idea of another way to approach an actual data collection that does not have, that is not indexed in a way you think it should be. A lot of it's just trial and error and a lot of diligence to find what you're looking for. But sometimes that's the only way you can find those little nuggets you need to forward your family history. All right, so that's a pretty fairly simple idea. I don't think uh, most of you, if you thought about it too much, you probably could have figured that out. I am looking for some new ideas on things to talk to you guys about, and I have a couple, and if you all send me an email at ask the ancestry, ask at ancestry.com, or you can mention it here in chat, um, I just got my DNA back from Ancestry DNA, and it might be interesting just to go through that add as an example. I was lucky enough to find some tree matches, so I could show you how you could use those to further your family history if you're interested. That might be a good idea. We had a lot of good response to the basic timeline demonstration we did. We could also do some more of that. We've also seen some requests for uh, more things on FTM. How do you sync properly? Maybe some ideas on, I'm uh, sorry, FTM stands for Family Tree Maker. How to do uh, syncing properly, how to do reports and those kind of things. So if you all are interested in that, let us know. I just see a question there that says, how about how to source info you find in these not yet indexed sources? That is a really good question. Um, for those of you that are track ancestors who are homeless, boy, that one sounds hard. Okay, so if you're going to source these things, uh, let's go back here. Well, actually, yeah. Um... I'm going to use my favorite navigation tool, the back button. There we go. So how do you source something like that? Now, I'm not going to write the whole source for you because they're sort of long and tedious. Uh, that was another one that was asked for is um, how do you source? And if you all, I mean, that's sort of a deep, advanced topic. But if you all want to give that a go, I'd be willing to talk about that as well sometime. Um, but how you source these is you can't give a specific page, but what you want to do is tell where that you found the information. It's right um, here. And the, the key thing here is it's a NORA database. It is U.S. Compiled Revolutionary War Military Services. You know, it's either M880 or, or yeah, M880 or M881. And then instead of giving the actual URL or the name you used to search on, you would say these are arranged alphabetically. What I can do is, because um, I have to think about sources, I don't do them well off the top of my head, I can write up a source for one of these and put it in the uh, little follow-on that we usually put in, and then you can look at it there. Maybe that would help. All right, so I'm seeing... Receive DNA results, interested in a presentation, some of you are in DNA. Okay. I think we'll schedule that. Um, have you done anything on searching black history? We do have done some classes on that at conferences. I'm not sure if we have done that in these. It's a really different um, thing to do, and I think that's probably a good one for us to try it. We could probably do a series on that. Let me take that idea back to people who are experts on that. How do you find ancestors prior to the revolution? Uh, that one is tough. You have to work really, really hard at it. All right, so, so if somebody wants a session on sourcing, what the heck? We could do that too. Ooh, getting stuff out of the shoebox. You know what? I will try and post something on askancestry.com on how to get stuff out of the shoebox. I know that's really a pain. All right. We probably ought to just try a question answer session too. I think that might really be fun sometime. All right, so look for things like DNA. Look for things like sourcing. That ought to be an interesting one. And, uh, and we'll, I will definitely get the FTM experts we have to do some stuff. Uh, I am sure they would love a chance to show you how to do that. Uh, 
couple upcoming events, and I think you all will be interested in some of these. Uh, the Hungary, Poland, Slovakia. I have an expert on that. We can get her on to talk about that. All right, so Saturday, Chris is doing a tweet chat at 7 a.m. Pacific time, um, which I guess is, what, 10 East Coast? Using Ancestry.com member profiles. That'll be Tuesday. And the next one on Thursday is my canvas and how to publish. You should sign up for that one if you're interested in publishing your family history. Ooh, I just see a request coming in for the lineage societies. It's tedious, Barbara, be warned. But that would also be a good idea. Um, another one that you may want to make sure that you sign up for is Ancestry.com Live, Common Mistakes in Genealogy. We all make mistakes. As well as the behind the scenes, Ancestry DNA. This stuff is really just starting for us and it's really cool. And I think you all would enjoy it. All right, thank you for joining me today. I will see you very soon.